Medical Center of Excellence assist in the unfurling of the SES flag. The Army authorizes individual flags to those who warrant, by, warrant them by virtue of their office. The use of flags to signify the presence of a general officer can be traced back to the British Royal Navy. The United States Army has incorporated the use of flags to signify the presence of a general officer and its senior executive service equivalents. This flag will be present at government functions and will be displayed in Mr. Holland's office. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we honor Mr. Joseph C. Holland on the occasion of his appointment as the Deputy to the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence. The presiding officer for today's ceremony is Major General Michael J. Talley, Commanding General, U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence. Please direct your attention to the front right seating area. At this time, Mr. Holland's wife, Mrs. Laura Holland, and his mother, Mrs. Cindy Holland, are receiving a bouquet of yellow roses. The yellow roses signify a warm welcome to the U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence family. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the invocation given by Chaplain Michael Spikes, U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence Command Chaplain, followed by the singing of the national anthem by Drill Sergeant Cordell Foster. Today, Major General Talley defers honors to Mr. Holland on this momentous occasion. Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have gathered today to honor Mr. Joseph Holland, our new deputy to the commanding general, and his appointment to the position of senior executive service. This appointment is indeed auspicious, and with it comes great responsibility and authority. And we know, Father, that all authority is, a grant, is granted and appointed by you. Here shortly, Mr. Holland will take his oath of office, sealing that oath by the sacredness of your name as he accepts this appointment. In doing so, Father, we pray that you would grant him wisdom and discernment, strength and fortitude, vision and insight, and all of the other virtues and qualities he will need as he takes on the mantle of leadership and its associated roles and responsibilities and that you would enable him to help lead our organization as we strive to expand and improve the future of Army medicine and conserve fighting strength. Therefore, Father, on behalf of Mr. Holland and his family, MedCOE, our military, and our nation, I offer this prayer in your name, Yahweh Adonai El Shaddai Rohai, proclaiming that you are indeed God Almighty and Lord over all. Amen. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watch 
were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof to the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you, Chaplain Spikes and Drill Sergeant Foster. At this time, we would like to welcome our distinguished guest, Mr. J. Randall Robinson, Executive Deputy to the Commanding General, Headquarters Income. Major General William Thigpen, Commanding General, Headquarters U.S. Army South. Major General Retired George Harmeyer and his wife Phyllis. Major General Retired Jimmy J. Wells. Command Sergeant Major Victor Laragione, Command Sergeant Major U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence, and his spouse Crystal. Brigadier General Russell Driggers, Commander JBSA and 502nd Air Base Wing. Chief Master Sergeant Gilda Alexander, Command Chief JBSA and 502nd Air Base Wing. Dr. Vic Convertino, Senior Scientist, Institute of Surgical Research. Mr. Chris Rainey, Deputy Chief of Staff, Resource Management, and AMED Civilian Corps Chief, Headquarters, MedCom. Mr. Holland would also like to recognize those here in attendance with him today. His wife, Mrs. Laura Holland, his father, Colonel Retired Barry Holland, and his mother, Mrs. Cindy Holland. And those attending virtually, his children, First Lieutenant David Holland, Ms. Emma Holland, Mr. Andrew Holland, Ms. Julia Holland, Father-in-law, General Retired David Maddox. Mother-in-law, Mrs. Ethel Mary Maddox. Aunt, Ms. Patricia Walker and her husband, Jim Walker. Command teams, soldiers, DA civilians, friends, and family attending in person and virtually. Thank you for attending today's ceremony. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the presiding officer for today's ceremony, Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence, Major General Michael J. Talley. Right. All right. All right. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, hey, thanks for coming here today. I, and I tell you, it is a, a rare occasion when we get to, to see the appointment of a Tier 2 level senior executive. Uh, it's about as rare as the eclipse that we just had. <laughs> so those of you that are here online, uh, you're in for something uh, very, very special. I want to thank the guests who are here. Uh, you know, certainly uh, we have uh, many of our dignitaries, our family members that are online. We have the family of, uh, of Joe Holland, who I'm going to talk about a little bit here. But uh, we've got General Heimeyer here, uh, the former Armor Corps chief. We have uh, Jimmy J here, uh, who I've served with in a previous life. Uh, General Driggers, uh, we have uh, the MCOM uh, deputy here as well, and, and Chris Rainey. Again, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to witness uh, this very auspicious occasion. Um, before I go any further, though, uh, Chaplain Mike Spikes, always uh, so eloquent, always so inspirational uh, when you talk about uh, the spiritual message, which uh, certainly Joe Holland and his family I certainly owe uh, the success that they've had uh, to, and that's, uh, that's certainly uh, the great uh, spiritual fitness that this family brings. Thanks, Chaplain Mike. And how about Drill Sergeant Foster? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Woo! Boy, I tell you, that, that's all you needed. The hair on the back of your neck stands up. But, hey, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're here to celebrate something very special. And uh, Joe has actually uh, already been appointed 
but we wouldn't let him get away without at least, uh, you know, uh, giving us some refreshments and beverages and all that. <laughs> so he thought he would just slip in here and, uh, you know, okay, I'm, I'm a, I'm a two-tier SES, but uh, the story's a little bit differently. And, again, uh, I, it is my privilege to, to be able to preside over this ceremony and pay homage to not just Joe Holland, uh, but certainly uh, a great uh, family, a great Army family, a great military family. It goes back uh, six generations. And uh, right now, uh, the Holland family, uh, beginning with uh, Barry Holland, uh, Joe's father, uh, Joe himself, and son David, who is online right now, that represents 60 years of military service. That's quite an accomplishment. But the Holland family story, like many of ours, is an American story. It's one that we can all take great pride in. So to achieve the rank of uh, two second tier uh, SES, it's, uh, it's a big deal, but I think it's important to talk about uh, how, how Joe arrived at this, uh, what propelled him, what, uh, what shaped him throughout his life. I think we have to begin by, well, what is a, an SES? You know, what is a tier two SES? And the Senior Executive Service uh, represents that layer of the federal government uh, that begins with the appointment of secretaries from the President of the United States. And so the SESs actually serve uh, as that, uh, that conduit between the President, the secretaries that uh, the President personally appoints. And the SESs represent uh, that continuity between the President, those secretaries, and then the military establishment. That's what an SES2 uh, does. That's what uh, the Senior Executive Service does. So having Joe certainly in our midst uh, is uh, it's more than a big deal, but it represents um, our linkage, our nesting uh, to, uh, to the national strategy, national security strategy, national military strategy, national defense strategy. And uh, it's, very, uh, it's very good that we have him in our ranks uh, when I tell you about his story. But his story uh, begins some time ago, uh, 55 years. As you see, Joe uh, grew up in a, in a military family his entire life. Uh, you know, several moves um, all over the world, uh, military dependent, if you will. And uh, when you talk to him and you say, what was, your, what was your greatest influence? You know, what the heck made you decide to come in and serve in the military? Because I think uh, when you read his bio, you see that he's a retired um, armor officer retired 06. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, you don't just uh, wake up one day and decide to join. But uh, it was throughout his life where he had uh, tremendous inspirations, beginning with his father, Barry, who uh, served two tours in Vietnam, uh, one of them in the 173rd Airborne as an infantryman, uh, two times in Vietnam, and uh, he survived. I came back and later became a quartermaster officer. He went on the dark side and became an acquisition corps officer as well, <laughs> which is how Joe ended up uh, in Chicago, of all places. Uh, but uh, his father, uh, just a tremendous influence on him, his example, uh, the grounding that he's had, that he's had uh, uh, steeped in tradition. And when you ask Joe, hey, who's, uh, who, who's the, the best mentor that you've ever had? Who's, the, who's motivated you the most? It's his dad, hands down, without a doubt. And oh, by the way, uh, Colonel retired Barry Holland, uh, I want to congr congratulate you uh, in a very belated fashion, but uh, he is a 2004 member of the Quartermaster Hall of Fame. That's a pretty big deal. And his mom, Cindy, uh, certainly uh, throughout uh, uh, his life, uh, Joe's life, uh, going around with the family, keeping the family intact, uh, deployments, uh, moving. You know, my wife's not here today because she's uh, with the Packers right now. Move number 26. And I'm told that uh, with all the moves you've had, it's, uh, it's even more than that. But that's, uh, that's what military families do. That's, uh, that's what they do, and that's what Joe saw growing up, uh, his father's example, those that he was around. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Joe has some interesting hobbies. Uh, you know, he likes to read. He likes to, uh, you know, study history. But uh, uh, the one hobby that struck me a little uh, peculiar is that he, he likes to read field manuals. Have you ever met anyone who likes to read field manuals? And, and I think his other one was doing PMCS. <laughs> I, I said, really? He said, well, my dad used to bring home these FMs, and I would read them. So that grounding, that shaping of being in the military and service and the technical aspects began there. 
Uh, Joe went on to tell me later that General uh, Haymeyer, who is uh, in, uh, in the audience today, uh, he actually met General Haymeyer while he was a high schooler in Germany and actually met him, would later on become his aide-de-camp. But these are the kind of influences that he had growing up. Uh, he was uh, in Germany when we still had a Soviet Union. He understood uh, the seriousness of, uh, of the military, and that's certainly what shaped him. So, uh, uh, you know, he in high school, uh, Joe was a cross-country runner, uh, good athlete. Uh, he was pretty good in high school, pretty good with the grades, but he found his real calling uh, later, you know, when he went on to college at uh, Loyola University in Chicago, is that uh, the thing he was pretty good at was ROTC. You know, and if you, if you know about Colin Powell, he was okay as a student also, but uh, they both thrived in ROTC, ROTC, our profession of arms, the military, again, which he had got a great introduction to from his family. So uh, anyway, he went on and uh, certainly uh, he came back, he came in, he got his first choice. He uh, did very well at advance camp, got his first choice as an armor officer, first duty assignment, which was back in Germany. Uh, where uh, he met his bride of 28 years, Laura. Uh, now, let me tell you uh, my version of how they met. After doing my, uh, my intelligence prep of the battlefield and uh, talking around. So Joe's the first lieutenant in Germany. And uh, Laura's father was uh, the USERA commanding general. And I think uh, he is online right now. But... Uh, <laughs> He was a use for a commanding general, but uh, uh, Laura at the time was a, uh, was a teacher, um, teaching in Falls Church, Virginia. And because her father was a commanding general, uh, they were, it was the summertime, and they came over, uh, you know, just to, just to tour Germany. She brought some of her, her teacher uh, comrades, if you will, and uh, there was a social function, a, you know, kind of a gala event. And, uh, you know, young ladies coming over, uh, you know, young uh, teachers, they needed, uh, they didn't have any, uh, any, any, any dates or any companions, if you will. So believe it or not, uh, Joe was one of a few lieutenants that was tasked <laughs> to go to this ball. Task. So he gets a tasking to meet his future wife. <laughs> Who does that? You know, what, what kind of military family does that? But anyway, uh, you know, uh, and I think uh, I'm told that it was uh, uh, Laura's mom that did the matchmaking mainly, uh, did a little nudging, et cetera. Uh, Joe tells me that you stalked him. Uh, he says that you stalked him, and, you know, I, I don't know what happened. But uh, the rest is history, and uh, let me tell you, they've been, uh, they've been together ever since. And they've raised uh, four uh, beautiful children. David is online right now, and he is that, uh, that third generation in a row of, uh, of military servants. And right now he is listening in from Athens, Georgia. He is a first lieutenant in the United States Army. He is the XO of a recruiting company. And everybody in here from Medco, if I said, in fact, I'm going to just ask, uh, raise your hands if you're a recruiter. See, every hand in here, David, went up. We're all Army recruiters, but we know that you have uh, an incredibly tough mission, as the entire military does right now with end strength, and uh, he, he is absolutely uh, doing the Lord's work down there in Athens, Georgia. But uh, David's 27, and like his dad, uh, like his grandfather, uh, you see uh, that commitment to service uh, steeped within this family. Uh, his, uh, his, his second uh, eldest daughter is, uh, is Emma, and uh, uh, that public service continues. She uh, just completed her uh, Master's of Public Health, and she works uh, for USAID. Uh, the world's foremost uh, international relief agency. And then uh, son Andrew, uh, he is at William & Mary right now, uh, completing school. Julia, who is uh, a sophomore at, at uh, Reagan High School, she too is, uh, you know, going through uh, high school. Again, uh, all, all the kids, when you ask them about military service, what's it like, uh, what's it like uh, being in the military, what's it like to move around, this is an all-in uh, military family, of course. Um, and I think uh, when you think about what military families go through, the courage that it takes for a military child to walk into a brand new school for the first time, uh, getting to know people that don't know you, uh, imagine how scary that is, and you do that over and over again. But I think for Joe, when you ask him what's most important in life, it's his family, and he shared with me the time it really hit him 
because uh, as, a, as an armor officer, as a, as a soldier, uh, you, you go on a lot of deployments. You do a lot of training missions. You know, uh, throughout uh, his career, you know, several tours in, Ger- in, uh, in, in various installations, but while in Germany and other places, uh, he, his daughter reminded him, Emma, uh, you know, hey, you, you've missed six birthdays in a row. I understand. And I think that's when it hit Joe. You know, there are things that are far more important in life, and it begins with my family, which is, uh, which is why he serves, which is why he stays in. But that's what military families do. Unsung heroes. Uh, you're not going to hear about or read what they do on Fox News or CNN. They just pony up and uh, they brave through things. That's the Holland family. And that's certainly their story, and that's what gives Joe uh, his greatest strength. And uh, they're the wind beneath his wings, without a doubt, and uh, that's, uh, that's what shaped him. But uh, I tell you, throughout his career, and some things you won't read in his bio, he's, uh, he commanded as an armor officer at all levels. Uh, commanded in combat two times, one of which it was uh, the 212 Cavalry. And uh, he brought every one of his soldiers home alive, and even though it was, uh, was a tough mission, uh, very kinetic, uh, but it took a leader like Joe to make sure they accomplished the mission. And he brought every single one of those soldiers home alive. Uh, he has been involved in strategy and policy at the highest levels of uh, not just the Army but the Joint Staff. He's been, uh, he's been in a position on the joint staff where uh, he was the chief architect for policies uh, and strategy that uh, deal now uh, with the placement of troops that are currently in, in Germany that could potentially face, uh, face Russia as, uh, as the uh, conflict in Ukraine continues. Uh, Joe's been on the ground floor of that. But what he also did and uh, what may, may resonate most with the Medical Center of Excellence, he served on a team that led to lower fatality rates with civilians on the battlefield in combat. And uh, tough study, very sensitive in nature, but uh, when you need a tough problem solved, it had always been someone like the likes of Joe Holland going in and solving those very, very complex problems. I got to know Joe a few years ago uh, as commanding general of the Medical Research and Development Command. And uh, I think uh, the day of the change of command, I, I found out, uh, hey, uh, you have the world's, not, not the country's, but the world's largest biosafety level four laboratory that has uh, just been shut down. If you, a BSL-4 lab, if you think of the movie Outbreak, where they're wearing those, uh, those funny suits and all that, very, very dangerous, highly toxic. Uh, this, is, uh, this is summer 2019. Make a summer 2019. This is before COVID hit uh, in January of 2020. And uh, the estimates were that uh, that laboratory, other things had, had just uh, deteriorated to the point where uh, the estimates were it would take about two years to get everything back on track. I met Joe because uh, he came down at the request of General Mike Murray, who, uh, General Murray, if you're online, uh, thanks again uh, for advising Joe uh, to, one, stay in a little bit past his, uh, his shelf life, if you will, but uh, Joe came down as investigating officer, uh, helped a lot out with uh, our campaign plan to bring the labs back up. And instead of two years, it took about six months to get those laboratories back up just in time uh, for the worst pandemic we've ever had. That's what Joe does. Uh, sent into the Army Futures Command. When uh, Futures Command uh, first got started, uh, had, uh, it had some growing pains. Well, they sent Joe in again uh, to fix those things. So uh, the second uh, influential thing that General Murray did is he encouraged Joe to not just stay in a little bit longer, but, hey, why don't you, why don't you consider uh, becoming a senior executive uh, in the federal government, which, uh, which Joe did after being hired uh, from a firm uh, right, around, uh, right around the corner in Austin, Texas. He did that, and we were able to bring him on at MRDC, where he served as uh, deputy commanding general over uh, Tony McQueen, who I think is listening right now also, and uh, we're lucky enough to have him as our Deputy Commanding General here at, uh, at the Medical Center of Excellence. And in the short uh, two months that Joe has been here, he has come in and quickly uh, made an assessment of where we are certainly with our civilian workforce, you know, the training, the education that has to take place with it. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, certainly a... Uh, National Defense Authorization Act, good idea that Joe is uh, taking the lead on because he has experience doing that. 
Um, so we are very fortunate to have Joe. And uh, I tell you, today, again, we are going to uh, we're going to recognize uh, this great accomplishment. As I said, he's been officially uh, promoted, if you will, to Tier 2 from Tier 1 SES. So you can call this a patch ceremony. You can call it a coronation or, or whatever you'd like. But uh, we, are, we are absolutely going to welcome Joe and his family uh, officially here today, introduce him, and then uh, uh, give him the rank that uh, is commensurate with his abilities and I have no doubt he will continue to excel as you look at, uh, as you look at uh, the need, certainly, for the continuity uh, within the military, within the federal government. So with that, uh, why don't we uh, continue the ceremony and uh, officially recognize uh, Joe Holland. Yes, sir. At this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Holland to come forward for the reading of the appointment order, administering of the oath of office, and presentation of the senior executive service flag. Please rise for the appointment order and remain standing for the oath of office. The Secretary of the Army has placed special trust and confidence in the experience and leadership abilities of Joseph C. Holland. In view of these special qualities and his demonstrated potential to serve in the higher grade, he is hereby appointed to the Senior Executive Officer, Tier 2, in accordance with Title V of the United States Code, effective this 19th day of October 2023. Signed, Christine Ormuth, Secretary of the Army. Go ahead with the oath. Okay. And if you would, uh, and uh, we're going to do this a little bit different. And we're going to change places, if we would, Joe. And what I'd like you to do uh, is uh, when we read the oath of office, very similar to our military oaths of office that we all take, uh, Joe is uh, reaffirming this oath uh, to a constitution, a set of ideas, a set of values, uh, the values that uh, he certainly grew up with, the values that, uh, that we all aspire to in uniform and certainly within uh, the federal service. But uh, it, I'd like you to listen to the word certainly and, uh, as we reaffirm this. Joe, I'd like you to take your uh, left hand and place it and clutch that American flag. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, state your full name. I, Joseph Carl Holland. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, against foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, and without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties, of the, office the duties of the office upon which I am appointed. Upon which I am appointed. So, help me God. so help me God. Thank you. Thank you, General Talley. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to direct your attention to the stage as Command Sergeant Major Victor Laragioni, Command Sergeant Major U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence, assist in the unfurling of the SES flag. The Army authorizes individual flags to those who warrant, by, warrant them by virtue of their office. The use of flags to signify the presence of a general officer can be traced back to the British Royal Navy. The United States Army has incorporated the use of flags to signify the presence of a general officer and its senior executive service equivalents. This flag will be present at government functions and will be displayed in Mr. Holland's office. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you the Deputy to the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Center of Excellence, Mr. Joseph Holland. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, um, thank you very much for being here. It is a great honor to have all of you here uh, representing your organizations and our time in service together, uh, whether that's uh, from my days as a young child uh, to uh, present day. And so I really appreciate all of you being here to help celebrate, not just for myself, but for this command and this community. San Antonio, the Hollands family home now, um, after quite a few tours in Texas uh, separately. We're thrilled that uh, you can all join us, um, and I'm quite simply astounded at the friendly welcome we have received and the introduction everybody has made of themselves to myself and my family. And for me, I've gotten much better acquainted to the very important life-saving measures ongoing here over the past two months, although I have to admit every day I feel like I'm drinking from the fire hose, a fire hose of medical doctrine, organizational change, training and education, material testing, leader development, personnel and facilities, and policy formulation insights. And the team represented here, principally in the first and second row from MedCOE, our colonels and sergeants major, do just that with me together. So thank you very much to all of you. I can hardly put a Band-Aid on correctly. So my work as a former armored cavalry officer is cut out for me. In my first 50 days or so here at the Medical Center of Excellence, or MedCOE as we call it, I've come to learn that this team is instrumental in expanding the golden hour into the golden window of opportunity of preserving life and conserving our readiness in combat situations. For that especially, and for those of you who know me personally, that is very meaningful to me. I am so very glad to be here. Focus forward as a soldier for life towards the objective of maximizing human potential, preventing injury to our soldiers, and enhancing survivability of our joint warfighter. Just as I've found my calling as a soldier for more than three decades, it seems our gracious God has provided me another opportunity um, and has issued a continuance of my calling, now giving me an orientation as a soldier for life and the prevention of injury and the preservation of life, which is quite a seismic shift from what I was doing as an armor officer for at least the first 20 years of my career. And before I go on, I want to remind everybody here that this would not have been possible uh, without some tremendous work of a number of key folks here at MedCOE. So let me give a big shout-out to Command Sergeant Major Larigione. Once again, he was my CSM at uh, MRDC when I was first inducted, and actually to stand up here with you is deja vu. And uh, Sergeant Major uh, Johnson um, as well, who was the orchestrator of this ceremony. Uh, thanks very much for doing just that, orchestrating a great ceremony, proving in time-honored tradition of our Army when a non-commissioned officer takes charge Things turn out right. Kudos as well to our chaplain, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Spikes, our baritone soloist, Drill Sergeant Cordell Foster. Now, he is not, he is not an MOS-trained vocalist. He is a 68 Delta. He is an OR tech. He's seen two combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I want to give you a round of applause, you and the chaplain, once again. Thanks very much. To Ms. Lydia Suarez, Mr. Chris Fowler, the command group team, our wonderful flower bearers of the Sergeant Audie Murphy Club, representatives of the MedCUE community of instructors, staff, faculty, and to all who work behind the scenes to provide tremendous outcomes for us every day. Thanks very much. Over the past two months, I've come to know MedCUE and Fort Sam and the larger team here at JBSA as organizations and institutions of exceptional performance and incredible forward-leaning potential. You have to be here at San Antonio um, because at least six months out of the year, it's really hot. 
Ladies and gentlemen, here at JBSA or Joint Base San Antonio, we have national treasure, our workforce, a team of incredible intellect and strong innovation, dedicated to conserving the fighting strength of our soldiers and the joint force. And I'd like to recognize a lot of those folks who are sitting in the back or standing in the back uh, with a round of applause. Thanks again. I'd like to say uh, thanks and recognize some key people here. My first thanks to my dear wife, Laura, for bearing with me through thick and thin and agreeing to yet another move, now our fifth tour in Texas. Um, and of note, we recently celebrated that 28th wedding anniversary that General Talley talked about while sandwiched in the Candlewood Suites here on post. And I'm glad that this is actually being recorded on DVID, so if it's not coming in live, we'll be able to watch it on Memorex uh, in the future. To our kids, David, serving as an infantry officer in Georgia. Emma, currently working in the global health field for USAID. Andrew, finishing his senior year at William & Mary. And Julia, 10th grader. Uh, thank you for being the most wonderful, special people I know. Thanks to my mom and dad, Cindy and Colonel Barry Holland, a distinguished member of the Quartermaster Hall of Fame. My role models across 58 years, correction, 55 years of life, who will celebrate, my parents will celebrate their 58th wedding anniversary in just a few days. <laughs> thanks to Laura's parents as well, the Maddoxes, my other mom and dad for sharing their wonderful daughter with me, and thanks to my family and close friends here in the first couple rows on the left who have come from far and near. Thanks for my, to the champions um, who have championed me for joining us. Uh, for without your instigations across 33 years of service and a little subtle arm twisting, I would certainly not be here. Thanks as well to Mr. Mike Formica and Mr. Dave Brinkley on the trade doc team. They were also part of the panel that hired me on, so this was, you know, not a, an easy thing to accomplish. And to my predecessor, Mr. Jay Harmon, our civilian deputy chief of staff, Dr. Randy Anderson. Uh, thanks for setting the conditions for successful transition and onboarding that is ongoing. This is a campaign of learning, especially for me. Um, it's great to have so many friends here today um, who have voyaged with me through a long career. A special shout out to battle tested compatriots and their families, both here and online. Generals Thurman, Brooks, Murray, Mallory, Henry, Lanza, Hunsecker, Pascaret. Harmeyer, Moranian, Davis, Gallivan, Taylor, Admiral, Cushing, McCurry, Dragon, Barlev, and McQueen. To friends joining us virtually and in person from Tours and Bombholder, Fort Knox times three, Fort Hood slash Cavazos times three, Fort Irwin, Fort Leavenworth, Baghdad, Heidelberg, Kirkuk, Carlisle, Wiesbaden, Camp Humphreys, the Pentagon, Austin, and Fort Dietrich, thanks so much for leaving an indelible mark on my professional development as well as on me as a human being. To my former Command Sergeant Major, Bill May, and Matthew McCoy, and the senior non-commissioned officers who served with us under their tutelage, you set the standard. Thanks very much. I would like to give a special thanks uh, to Major General Talley, who willingly accepted my request to host this ceremony and promote me to a, a keystone member of our civilian leadership here at MedCUE and to introduce me to the JBSA community. Thanks as well to our general officer leaders and SES leaders here at JBSA. I really look forward to working with you into the future. I'm no stranger to Texas. In fact, I was reminded uh, at dinner last night, one of the first family pics uh, that uh, was taken of myself and my mom is uh, when she's holding me as a six-month-old atop a large concrete block in the shape of Texas at the Sabine River crossing um, I truly got here as fast as I could. <laughs> and to provide a deeper connection to the state, Laura's family goes uh, back in the state of Texas uh, well over 150 years to a period after the Civil War and a plethora of men and women all fleeing the aftermath of that war settled along the northern edge of the Edwards Plateau. Those hardworking farmers, ranchers, ministers, and physicians were glad to escape the southern states for the chance that they can make a better life for themselves and their families here in the American West. I am thankful to them as well for giving of themselves to provide a better future in the wake of an existential crisis in America. Now let me reflect a little bit about 
today. It's been several months since MedCUE had a senior executive service executive, but in the process of bringing me on board within the past six months of Mr. Harmon's departure, I've noted it was exceptionally quick. And for those of you who've been through an SES process before, six months is, is pretty quick, uh, all things considered. It's important to know that uh, the senior executive service emblem is a keystone on that flag is a keystone um, that we unfurl today. It represents a center stone that holds all of the stones in the arch in place. It, it represents the critical role, as General Talley has indicated, as a central coordinating point between the Army's senior civilian leaders and our executive branch, which set strategy and policy, and the workforce who implement it. Leaders in the SES Corps translate policy objectives into reality. The upright lines in the center of the keystone represent a column in which individual SES members are united in a single leadership corps. And I am especially pleased and proud to have fellow SES members and members of our um, ASCCs who are deputies here with us today. Great to have you here. This is a significant time, not just for me, but for the entirety of the command team here at MedCUE and for the civilian staff that have been building careers here at Fort Sam and JBSA. My appointment as the Deputy of the Commanding General means our civilian team, nearly 650 strong, have the continuity of leadership and consistent support of their career development. And as Major Talley intimated and as bears repeating, my charge includes being a positive example to our civilian enterprise and a champion of their development and well-being. In my role here at Medical Center of Excellence, I'm glad to take on an oversight responsibility as well in the command's focus on medical modernization. Given my prior role at Medical Research and Development Command at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and at Army Futures Command in Austin, I've got some firsthand experience in working with the team there as well as down here in Texas as well. And it is with that familiarity that I can bring our capabilities together working to modernize military medicine out to 2040. And I look forward to using my knowledge to support our commanding general and the command as we navigate our way ahead over the next few years. While the role of the deputy of the commanding general provides leadership continuity to the team, it also creates a broader continuity for our stakeholders and the various agencies and partners who help us achieve our goals. I commit myself as an approachable leader who can build and foster relationships as MedCUE continues to lead the advancement of military medicine. This is my calling. Now, as a student of history, especially as it intersects and provides lessons for us to the current day, I'd like to share a family story about Laura's grandfather, which I hope illustrates our work uh, at MedCUE and why it is so important. On September 12, 1918, while serving as a courier in the Army's 1st Trench Mortar Battalion near Pont-a-Mousson, France, Private Roy Key McCleskey, while delivering military matters to an adjacent organization, rode his bicycle through a plume of freshly dispersed artillery-delivered mustard gas. Roy was temporarily incapacitated due to the effects of the gas. His lungs burned from inhaling the noxious toxin. He spent a few days at a battalion aid station near Metz, France. While lying on a cot there in the aid station, he received word he would be evacuated rearward for further care. Hearing this, he was gripped with fear, not for himself, but that he would be separated from his fellow soldiers with whom he had served and survived a campaign across northern France. So in the dead of night, Roy stole a medic's white coveralls from the aid station laundry line and made off in order to return to his unit. Private Roy McCleskey was a survivor in a company which had experienced nearly 75% casualties in fights from San Miguel to the Meuse Argonne. Through it all, he had experienced and survived withering machine gun fire, artillery barrages, and the more mundane duties like serving in burial details and cooking camp fare, and he was damn sure he was not going to be separated from the men with whom he had served due to the effects of some sort of gas attack. Roy recounted later in a story preserved for posterity at the University of Texas Library in Austin how he escaped from the aid station 
but it, that it unfortunately had disadvantaged him in his claim for disability compensation and that it was that that claim was disregarded by the Veterans Administration, principally because he did not have a medical documentation or certification for the basis of his claim of surviving a gas attack. Though Roy lived out his life to the fullest for five more decades, he suffered the effects of scarring in his lungs and from the psychological and physiological impacts of his survival in the campaign across France. Our greater purpose here at MedCOE is to ensure soldiers are first protected from debilitating injury on the battlefield, in a field training environment, in the conduct of their duties in a garrison environment. And when they are injured or wounded, we at MedCE, we provide timely and effective trauma-mitigating, life-saving measures in everything that we do across the Dotland PF to return those soldiers and military members to fight another day and be resilient and productive members of our American society when they conclude their service. So in closing, I'd like to thank all of you for either tuning in or attending the ceremony today. Conserve the fighting strength, be all you can be, and may the Lord bless our coming and going both now and forever. Congratulations, Mr. Holland, and thank you for your remarks. Now the playing of the Army song and the departure of the official party and family. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. You are invited to congratulate Mr. Holland at the reception in Abel Hall next door to my left and to your right. Thank you for attending today's ceremony. <laughs>